to take it to the dry and get it. And who stole the box? <laughs> okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Emily Olesino has a BS in history, a master's in education, and is ISOG regional coordinator, a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists and uh, the Genealogical Council of Oregon. Now, uh, Emily is a retired school teacher, but runs several um, uh, 11. projects, 11 uh, surname <laughs> projects and various other projects on family tree DNA. Uh, she's come all the way from Oregon. Please give her a very warm welcome. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Glad to see all of you here. Now, I've given you a handout, so quickly, if you will look through the handout, you may not have to take a bunch of notes. There are some things here that we will see on the slides, so I don't want you manically copying everything. So run through it, and that'll help you actually when you're gone. As well as, like I said, my book is available, 15 euro, and it really is based um, on helping the new people learn. It goes a little beyond that. If you feel frustrated, my email is in it, or grab my card in the back. I'm always answering email. All right. So, autosomal DNA, it tells you about your cousins. So who are your cousins? AT DNA notes, our abbreviation for autosomal. This is the agenda for today. We are going to go through just some general basics. This is a, not a high, high level of doing this. This is down at the beginner level and just a bit beyond. So what is autosomal DNA? How is it inherited? Chromosome mapping, finding common ancestors, a few statistics, which are in your handout, and some great success stories. We inherit one chromosome from dad and one chromosome from mom for each of our 22 chromosomes. And they're numbered from 1 to 22. The largest is three times larger than chromosome 22. So number one is three times larger than number 22. The other chromosomes we inherit <coughs> excuse me, are the X and the Y, our sex chromosomes. As you all know, you have to have two X chromosomes to be a female and an X and a Y to be a male. In general, there's always a few strange exceptions with DNA. However, um, what you need to know is that each of these are pairs. As you can see, there are two blue pairs, and, or two of chromosome one that are blue, one from mom, one from dad. That's very important to understand and know. So what is autosomal DNA? It's the random inheritance from all your bloodline ancestors. Now, each generation receives approximately 50%. So some of it goes away. We cannot say that we have a great deal of our DNA from our great, 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 whatever grandparents. Each generation, we lose some of that. It determines our unique appearance. That's why you look like your siblings or your aunt or your uncle in some areas, but not totally. Even identical twins have some differences in DNA. And if you'll notice on this, we find that the young man at the bottom inherited from his grandfather large ears. And he also inherited from his fa uh, father his bushy hair. So we get some traits. Autosomal DNA generally gives you matches from anywhere on the sixth generation pedigree chart. Now, it does go further back, and we'll talk about that. Um, and it doesn't guarantee that you get them all, but thank goodness, because if you look at your 64 fourth great grandparents and every descendant they, they ever had, we would really have difficulty trying to figure everything out. So that's always nice. Um, however, we have 64 fourth great grandparents. How many of you actually know all 64 of your fourth great grandparents? That can be a good thing too. Too many things to deal with otherwise. It determines the degree of relationship. It'll tell you if you're first cousins or if you're in a range of cousinship. It'll also tell you if someone is your father or a stepson, or depending on who you test, of course, or a half-cousin or a half-aunt. 
it, it gives you that. It does find half siblings. So as someone said previously, if you do not want to know the truth, don't take a DNA test. You never know what's gone out there. And I could give you a few stories uh, of living people and no paperwork to prove it. It finds close cousins for adoptees, which is a real plus. And I'll have a story or two on that later. It matches either gender. Originally, it was difficult if you had a Y chromosome, you matched only males. And then males could take the mitochondria as well as females. But only females could take the mitochondria, the mother's 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 line. Now, everybody can match everybody, which is wonderful. And it does provide your ethnic makeup. So it will tell you if you're so much Western European, African, Asian, and whatever populations the particular company uses. And that varies, like was previously said, if you were here. Um, it's going to change due to the population basis they use. And the more uh, time, those are going to be tweaked. So don't take it to the bank. It is not going to be absolutely 100% true. The autosomal inheritance since 2010 was all of these generations plus one. The slide didn't fit to have six generations. Um, so, as I said, from your 64 fourth great grandparents, anybody down to you and your siblings. We're going to look at these chromosomes and how things recombine, because that's what happens in autosomal DNA. In a perfect world, the top, let's say the top deck of cards, all lined up, they're all red, let's call it mom's chromosome, chromosome 15. And uh, the bottom could be dad's chromosome, chromosome 15. You get one from mom, one from dad, but it's never this pure because they inherited it from their parents. So more likely, it would look something like this, shuffled. And you'll see that some of the colors are red and some are black because mom got some from her father and from her mother and the same with dad. If they wanted to have a child, and each child would come out with a different shuffle, it could look like this, even more. Now, we're going to pretend that this segment of red, um, this segment of black, or even these, are definitely segments that came from one ancestor or another. That's how it operates, and we'll talk about segments a little later. But this could be the conglomeration of all your direct line ancestors or bloodline ancestors um, from mom and all from dad. In reality, it's easy to see which came from mom and which came from dad by the colors of the dexacard. Not so when we look at the number results in DNA, but there are ways, and we'll talk about that. First of all, also, when they test the autosomal, they test the X chromosome. And males inherit the X chromosome differently than females. So I want to show you that. And thanks to Dr. Blaine Bettinger, we have these fan charts. Uh, all of you know what a fan chart looks like. It is a pedigree chart. You start with yourself at the center circle and move on back. You can see for males, they get their X from mom. They do not get an X from dad. They get the Y. So with an X from mom, it can only come from the mom's line, but it can come along any of these blue or pink lines. What I want you to notice is, let's say, grandmother. It could get it from her grandmother, from her grandmother all the way down. And she could have gotten it from her grandfather and the grandfather's mother. What you don't notice here, perhaps, is the fact that there's no two blue squares touching because a male cannot give the X chromosome to another male. So this chart makes it so much easier if you plot your lineage on it and your matches lineage on a different one. Consequently, for the female, we have a little more work to do. We have two X's, one from mom, one from dad. Principle is still the same. A male cannot give the X to another male. <coughs> But you could inherit X chromosomes from a male. It's just you have to follow the chart. 
now mapping chromosomes. It is important to learn how to map, and I have cut it down to five little steps. My book in Chapter 12 gives you more information, but this is five easy steps. The reason you map your chromosomes is the fact that you want to determine what segments came from what ancestors. You're not going to get all the answers, but you can get many. Or it also is determined where you and a match have a common ancestor. So you're, you're looking at your matches and you're saying, all right, we match in this segment, this chromosome, and we have to share a common ancestor. So you compare pedigree charts and work back. Also, to organize your information. Each test for Family Finder or even Ancestry DNA or 23andMe are approximately 700,000 pieces of result. When you have hundreds of matches, and in some cases thousands, that's a lot of data to play with. Now, we don't play with each little piece. We're playing with segments today. But it's still a lot of information that helps you organize it. And we'll show you some examples of that. The other thing you need to know for mapping is a few basic terms. Now, I have some in your handout. However, I'm just going to concentrate on just a few today and let you know exactly what you need to know, absolutely have to understand. And the other thing is, if, if you can test a few possible cousins, your life is going to be a little easier in trying to find that common ancestor. However, um, then you compare your matches, and then you compare the pedigrees to find the common ancestor. Those are basically the steps, but there are ways around if you cannot test a, co a, a cousin. Now, one of the terms that can be um, necessary to understand are the nucleotides and base pairs. Most of you probably know that our DNA is made up of these four nucleotides, thymine, guanine, adenine, and cytosine. They pair together. And always thymine and, guine, or thymine and adenine pair together, and cystosine and, and uh, guanine. Now, uh, cytosine, pardon me, and guanine. What you can easily remember this. You don't have to. You just need to know those letters, ATGC, in some cases. Um, but when they pair together, think of it this way. The A is made with straight lines. The T is made with straight lines. They link. The C and G are curved lines. They link. So it's very easy to remember. And our base pairs, too. Um, we have over 3.5 billion base pairs that are, ex um, it, it's an estimate, in our um, genome. So it's a lot of information. But these little things tell us exactly what body part to do, what body part does what, et cetera. It's all total DNA and how we create our body and what traits we have. Oops. All right, the, this U star, this one you must understand to do chromosome mapping. It's in your handout, but make sure this is the one. It's called half identical region or HIRs. And so this is the definition. So let's look at it. A section or region of a chromosome where at least one of the two paired bases, those ATGCs, right? One of them um, matches with another person, exactly the same. So they have to have A where you have A, or C where you have C. So, huh? Yes, we kind of look at that. But here it is. That's all it is. It's a section where they're paired up. So each person has the same base, same nucleotide. Thank goodness the companies do that for you. But that's how they arrive at matching segments. We're going to look at a couple of cases of HIR. These are my two cousins, Daniel and Garrett. Even though it's spelled that way in my family, that's what it's pronounced. Or I'm sorry, Gerald, uh, not Gerald. And so um, they look like they match on chromosome 9, don't they? It doesn't have to be exact. It just needs to be a good size match. So in this is a copy from uh, Family Tree DNA. You can actually look at the table. Up, oh, back, back. Okay. 
Um, you can view it in a table or you can download it to Excel. I would not personally download two things to Excel. I do my entire set of matches, but we want to look at it in a table. And this is what it looks like for Daniel. Now, I want you to look down here. You'll see one page, two page. That is, the second one is Gerald. So the first one here is chromosome 9, and this is where my cousin Daniel matches me. You'll notice chromosome 9, this is the start position, and this is the end position. And all of this section are those ATGCs that match me perfectly. Now, a really important thing is the centimorgans, right here, centimorgans. And as you can see, we share 72 plus centimorgans. Centimorgans is a little more complicated than this definition, but I want you to just think of it in this term. It is the quality of the match. The how larger the centimorgans, the closer the relationship. Okay? Now, I have on the next page shown you Daniels and Geralds. This is where both of them match me. And I happen to know, yes, one is my first cousin once removed, and the other is my second cousin. HIR means this. You need to look at the chromosomes, find that segment that match you and two or more other people. Then you have to find out from those other people, do they match each other? If all of you match each other, all of you share a common ancestor. If you don't, it came from the other side of your family. So for example, I know that Daniel is on my father's side. So, Gerald, if he matches Daniel, all of that's on my father's side. Otherwise, Gerald is on my mother's side. Okay? Now, we're going to look, comparing Gerald and Daniel, and see what their match is. Nothing. So, like I said, one is actually on my father's side and one is on my mother's side. If you don't do that, you're making an assumption that can be greatly incorrect. <laughs> So you understand HIR, your home. It really will make it much easier. So those two are not related. They're both related to me, but not to each other. And that's what you need to know with HIR. Now, finding common ancestors. That's the purpose, isn't it? Because we want to share pedigrees, and we want to get our lines further back or find out more information on our lines, at least. Perhaps somebody actually has photos or other documentation that we would like to see. Well, the easiest way is to test known cousins, like I did Gerald and Daniel. And separate your pedigree chart when you do it. And I'll show you how they separated my chart. Download your matches list, which you saw how to do the segments list. And on Family Tree DNA, as well as 23andMe, you can download segments and matches. Both of them do that. Ancestry is a different story. Um, so you want to download those into a, a spreadsheet. It's a lot easier, and you only have to know the basics of a spreadsheet. I am not a computer geek at all. So then you have to determine the half-identical regions, like I did with Daniel and Geralt. And then you share genealogies deep and wide. And for autosomal testing, you do not want just the direct line ancestors. You want to bring those ancestors from the past down to the present as much as you can along siblings and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, because the more information you have, the easier it will be to find the common ancestor. That's really how you find them. So we're going to look at a pedigree chart. This is me. And uh, what I decided years before people were starting to do mapping, it made sense to me that if I um, tested one of my cousins, I would know, is it from my mom's side or my dad's side? So I first tested Doug. And Doug and I have the same grandparents, which is Guy and Georgia. When Doug matches someone, I match someone, and we all three match each other, I know it's on my father's line. That's nice, but the more cousinships you test, second and third, it's even easier, so you break it down. So I tested another cousin, Dan, the one you saw previously. And he and I and Doug relate with Benjamin and Tina. In my family, it's Tina, not Tina. And it's not an abbreviation for anything. 
So if Dan and I match, I know it's on Ben and Tina's side. If Doug, Dan match, it's on Ben and Tina's. If Doug, Dan, and I match, it's still on Ben and Tina's. Okay? Now, good and bad, Ben and Tina were first cousins. Makes my life a little more complicated. So what I would really want to do is find a cousin to test that is related only to Tina or only to Ben. And that will help break those two lines down. Because I've had matches on, cousin, uh, on Ben and Tina with me, and they would come out listed as like third cousin. They're not third cousins, because we know the genealogy. They're actually seventh cousins. Because I inherited more from those two since I'm missing two great-grandparents. So I'm getting more of them, because they have the same relatives. Not to be left out, I tested my mom's site. So now you can see where Gerald came from. He is on my mom's line with John and Ervilla. And then I tried another line for, with Lowry and Mary and tested my cousin Robert. Now, some, these are all men, but you do not have to use men. You can use women. Actually, I tested Rebecca, which is a relative of Robert. And so, you, you know, it doesn't matter is my point. I have more men in my family anyway. So this broke down my pedigree chart. And if I match some of these people and they match each other, I know where to start looking on my pedigree chart. Not everybody of my matches is going to connect to those guys. But it helps. It helps narrow the gap and where to start looking. Now, when you download a matches spreadsheet, this is pretty crowded because the screen slides are not large enough. You get basically um, these categories. Now, I've added uh, the, the ancestral line from where my family came, when I know who is who. As you can see, this is my son and my granddaughter and the first cousin, whatever. And I do know the connection. So I put in initials and the birth date. You can do it however you wish. And that tells me it came from that couple. So you can see this one person is my second cousin, and that would be Robert, really, um, my second cousin. And so RGG is my ancestors, Gilmore, that came from Donica D, Northern Ireland. And his wife, Helen Storier, who originally was in um, Dundee, Scotland, and came over when they helped build the harbor in 1820s or something. Um, been there. It's a great little town, and they also have a wonderful, the oldest bar in, bar in Ireland, Grace Nell's. Great one. Um, so anyway, you can do your matches spreadsheets. Then you can add whatever columns you need, but it will give you the list of names if your, ans if your matches have surnames. It'll give you a list, and it tells you what the cousinship is at here, and then when you're, this is a suggested cousinship. But I always put down what it is for sure, once it's proven. All right, so when you download your segment spreadsheet, here's a couple of cues. Do download these and keep the segment pristine. Have a copy that is an original and you don't touch it. Make a copy of that spreadsheet and then you're going to start playing with it. In this case, I have already ordered it in chromosome uh, segments. So all the ones show up at the top, and 22 is down at the bottom, and X is below that. And then I ordered it by a start and stop <coughs> position. And on Excel, you can do all three of those steps at the same time. Then it tells me how many centimorgans. You notice this one, 3.47 is very small. Typically, on um, uh, centimorgans, as a newbie, a new person to this, you probably want to pick only the highest and work with those first. Any centimorgan 10 and below can be what we call IBS, which is identical by state. And it means that it's been handed down generations to generations so far back without being mixed that you'll never find out the common ancestor because genealogy records don't go that far. However, these tiny little ones, it could be that, or it could be some other issues um, that people are aware of, like a common segment that has the chemical basis, the nucleotides that are the same for many Western Europeans, etc. But we're going to look at this. 
I see here are two matches. They're obviously different people because I've, you know, taken out all that. And uh, we are on chromosome one. We're only 8.13 centimorgans, but this is the start and stop, and it's perfect. So that could be something that comes way back, or I might be able to find the common ancestor. I would email each of those people and say, hey, do you match each other? However, Family Tree DNA has, now has a way that you can look yourself. And maybe even increase that a bit because those other people are in the same range. So all of us may have a common ancestor, but more than likely some do because it came from one chromosome in my family, either my dad or my mom, and some would come from the other. Here's an example. Doug and, and Dan are my cousins, of course. But when you match, it's not going to always be the same segment. So you need to pick out what part of that segment is actually valid. So Doug and I match on chromosome 12 at this start and end position, and we have a nice set of uh, centimorgans, CMs. Dan and I match, and you'll see that. Then Doug and Dan match. So I've compared everybody. I know we all have a common ancestor, but those numbers are very different. So what you need to look at is this. You need to look at the largest start and the smallest end, because all of us share that piece. And in sharing that piece, we know that comes from Benjamin and Tina. The rest could come from some other relative, or it just so happens that Doug inherited a little more from Ben and Tina than the rest of us, because everybody inherits differently. Okay? So you always take the smallest of what everybody matches, and then you can call it from that ancestor. But a lot of times, unless you've really broken down your pedigree chart, it's going to be an ancestral couple. Like I said, I haven't broken down Ben and Tina yet. Once I do, I may be able to find something that says, oh no, that part's from Ben, this part's from Tina. So you have to do this to determine from whom you inherit the segment. You need to look at the small piece. Then we're going to look at another example. 23andMe used to round everything. Uh, you still see it rounded when you go to their page, but when you download, you get more exact uh, chromosome start and end positions. So Tara and I match. Tara and Doug match. Jane and I match, Jane and Doug match, and then, of course, Doug and I, we know we're first cousins. We match. It's all relatively in the same place. And, of course, I'm going to have more matching with Doug. However, what do I need to do? I need to find out if Tara and Jane match. If they do not match, then Tara's on one of my chromosomes, Jane's on the other. Same with Doug, probably. So in checking Tara and Jane, which you can do on the 23andMe website, yes, they match. So all four of us have a common ancestor. It's a matter of sharing pedigrees and finding that common ancestor. I know it's on my dad's side. If they've tested cousins, they know where, you know, which side of the family it's on for them. Just what I said. Okay. This one gets me, and I love this little icon. Why don't all of our cousins match? That is in your paper. You don't have to jot this down, but I want to just let you know a couple of things. As you can see here, that we inherit 50% from mom and dad. And then after that, it is random. We may get 25% from each grandparent, maybe a little less, a little more, and each person's going to be a little different. The only guarantee is we get 50-50 from mom and dad. But it breaks down. And as you can see, with each generation, it's virtually cut in half. So that's a reason when you get down to third cousins, there's very little. It doesn't mean you won't find the common ancestor. It doesn't mean you don't match. But it is a little more of a struggle. The other way of looking at this is that you are 99%, you have a 99% chance of matching second cousins. 90% for third, but look at fourth. 50-50. This means even if you test a fourth cousin and you don't match, it's okay. It doesn't mean they're not your fourth cousin. Uh, it just means you didn't inherit enough of the DNA that they inherited or vice versa. 
So test more fourth cousins. You'll match some, you won't match them all. And then it gets much more remote. But again, if you're endogamous, endogamous meaning that your family married within a certain area or within a, a, a religion or some other group that married cousins all the time, like Tina and Benjamin, who didn't get out of the hollers, um, so they married each other, you're going to tend to have that push back. So you can get a sixth cousin, a seventh cousin, and even more. All right, so the other thing is, you can always look at it, like Moore showed earlier. If you're a parent and child, you're going to have approximately that many central mortgages you share. Again, it's going to vary. It's, it's going to fall within a range in the middle or a little on one side or the other. It varies with each person because we inherit differently. First cousins, a few more. But it goes down. You see how it goes down greatly and quickly. Each generation, DNA drops off to add to that new spouse that comes in, right? To give room for that new spouse. Success stories. This is the fun part. I really enjoyed this, and I'm very happy to share a few. If any of you come and listen to Debbie Kennett when she speaks, uh, she may talk about her own little success story, although I've added it briefly here. And the first one is an email that Family Tree DNA uh, received about uh, finding her father or his father's sister, a half sister. And so they sent a picture in, and all the names have been allowed to be used if they appear here. Okay. And so this is a guy in Georgia and uh, who obviously works for a law firm. So they were very happy, you know, especially as we get older, we want to connect, we want to know. So this is what the chromosome looked like. Rusty is the, the father, his son, and a half-sister. And on this, you can see that the dark back here is always the person from whom, with whom you're comparing. The dark, it's actually blue, but it looks black. But that's Rusty. Then the next person is his father, which is in orange, and then the half-sister. So you can see that Rusty has inherited a chromosome from his dad all the way down, from 1 to 22. But the half-sister, it's mixed. So she hasn't um, inherited everything. She wouldn't. I mean, she has a, a mother or a, that's different or a father that's different, and uh, that's going to, to change things. But the point being, they can determine by how much you inherit whether or not you're a half-sibling or a half-aunt or whatever the case may be. This one, the dustbin baby. Have all of you heard of her? Ah, that's wonderful. Um, I emailed Michelle and asked her for permission to use this. The, 45 years ago, the mirror ran a story um, saying that there was a baby that was put into a duffel bag and left out on the street on a November night in 1968. And it was next to the trash. She remained there all night. And luckily, a curious woman came out, looked at the duffel bag, and I don't know, moved it something or other, and realized it was crying. She took the child out, went to the hospital with the child. The nurse in the hospital, uh, who, one of the nurses, actually ended up adopting her. And her husband was a policeman. They couldn't find any connection, but Michelle grew up in a very happy life. Her step-parents, very happy, and she always wanted to know who her parents were. I mean, you have that nagging feeling. You're not complete. You're not whole. Who are my parents? Where am I from? What's the deal here? Well, she took a full mitochondria sequence test. That's the mother's 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 lunch. She took the full thing, which is the best, and she found out she also took the family finder test, and she found out that she's 76% Europe, European, 18% Jewish, 4% African, and 2% Middle Eastern. What a great mix. Um, I'm 99% Western European, so it's exciting to see some little changes here. Well, later on, about two years later, she got a match on her uh, family finder test with a first cousin a woman named Frances. So she sent Frances the article in the mirror, and Frances was taken back. 
really taken back because of the similarities in her family. Well, first cousins, they are going to be close. And so Francis took the FMS, the full mitochondria, and didn't match. So they knew it was the father's line. Francis is on the father's line. All right, so they started talking, and Francis had two uncles who were living that would be of the right age. And the one John tested, that was her father. And this is a picture of her father, uh, Michelle when she was a baby, Michelle now, and her father. And one of the articles has been in several times in the paper. So she's very, very happy. And they've had a great relationship. She has two children, um, and now they have a grandfather, and she's met other cousins. Um, John had no idea that his liaison was pregnant. No idea. And um, Michelle's now looking for her mother and really would like to know. So if you want to help Michelle, here's an email. Okay, Debbie Kinnett. Debbie is from the UK, and she's a speaker here. Um, and all of her family's from the UK, right? She got matches in Canada. So the, uh, the match was from the Family Finder test again, and it was her dad's second to fourth cousin, somewhere there, and her fifth to distant cousin which is a little ways out there. However, they corresponded, they compared, and they realized that, hmm, there's one person who left the UK, wasn't heard of, they, they didn't know he left, but there were no records for him, after 1841. And somebody appears in Canada that fits the bill. Well, in all of the work that they did, they realized, aha, this is the connection. And she says to me, uh, the Y-DNA test results prove that the two men shared the same all-male line. So they gave each the Y along with the family finder. And it was not conclusive proof that their ancestors were brothers, but they do think so. They said, however, the combination of evidence is very strong from the fact that this is a brother that didn't show up in the UK and then one with the same name, about the same age, blah, blah, uh, showed up. So they're very confident this is the common family. One more real quick. Whoops, that's Debbie and her um, matches, sorry. Uh, the start and, and end position with, um, her dad, her dad and this um, cousin in Canada, that's where they matched. Rebecca and I. Rebecca and I have, um, I, know her, I know her relationship. We have a common ex. And this is where it is. However, I didn't know from what ancestor, for sure. So I plotted mine like I showed you before. Beverly is my mother and goes on back, but I knew it was on this section, so I didn't have to plot the whole thing. But I didn't know, is it from Lowry, Mary, or does it go further back? Then I plotted Rebecca's. And you notice in the pink or blue, the only places we can match. So that X came from Mary, because Lowry couldn't give it to Rebecca's grandfather, Robert. That makes sense? Okay. Ah, uh, this is my husband's line, and he's out golfing right now, so I can talk. <laughs> um, this is his mother, right here and right here, and this is her sister, Connie, and all three of them are dead now, but I was lucky enough to get enough uh, DNA to prove this. These two women grew up with a girlfriend, right here, Vivian. The family scuttlebutt in America was that Vivian was really a full sister, and that sister uh, was, have, was given away because the was born young, mother died, and father couldn't take care of her. Had two young children beside. Well, after testing the DNA, not so. I went to Italy, and I told them that story, and they said, no, no, that's not the story. Grandma got out and had an affair while she was married to grandfather. Is my parents' grandmother and grandfather. So 
Vivian, when we did the D oops, when we did the DNA, she is a half aunt to my uh, uh, my husband. The story in Italy is correct, but I had to do the DNA to prove it because I even have an affidavit from Connie right here who says, "Oh no, the story here is right." But it's an old Italian family, and they'll tell you whatever they want to tell you. So you have to be very careful about oral stories. Anyway. Uh, the next one is my Gilmore second cousin, Shirley, is not my second cousin. My grandmother and her grandfather were siblings. When we took the family finder test, there was no match. To the point, she's been my second cousin all my life. I called up FTDNA and I said, what? What's going on here? They go, no match, no error, no match. So, we knew that both families had illegitimate children. My grandmother had a child before she married my grandfather. My mother was the oldest, so it gets a little dicey, you never know. Her grandmother had four children. We know one was illegitimate during that marriage. And the family knew this from the get-go. So each of us tested a different descendant on our Gilmore lines. And this is the Gilmore from Donegadi. And they lived in Dublin prior to that. But we tested them to see who's the real Gilmore. I am. Her grandmother got out twice. Two children out of the four. So she's a half ma match to her Gilmore uncle, which means that, that that was the problem. So the illegitimate children, they tested the Y chromosome. And they matched. So they had the same father. So I said to Shirley, at least your grandmother liked him. <laughs> okay. So now at least she has the correct surname for herself, although she still goes by Gilmore, because when we're raised this way, it's in bread. You feel like a Gilmore, whether you are or not. And, um, and, but she knows now how to correct her lineage and how to trace the right line. And that is success, correcting your lineage. And that's what DNA will do for you. Here's a picture of them, and from the picture, you could tell, if you look at these two, they look somewhat alike, you know, when you got, you're looking at the nose, the high forehead, and then these two, George and Lowry, this is the one we know that was illegitimate. This is her father, Shirley's father, Lowry. So there's probably some other uh, pieces that you could pull out just from the photo, but don't do it just by photo. You know, after you DNA test, then you can say, oh, well, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Doing it the other way is not going to be assured. So, this one, triangulation, and I shall hurry through it. Um, the problem was a friend of mine, David Pitts, who owns the uh, Pitt DNA Project, runs it. They had a, a Mary Lenore Pitt, who uh, was a daughter of Pittman Pitts, and Mary C. Andrews. So they wanted to know if that was really the daughter. What they did is they tested seven descendants, descendants of, of Pittman and Mary. And they did Nancy, who was the descendant of Mary Lenore Pitts, to see if there was a match. Five cousins out of the seven matched Nancy on different chromosomes, though. Well, you know that... Pittman and his wife gave 50% to their children, so <coughs> this is possible, especially if you're doing this much testing of cousins. Two didn't match, however. So if we look at this, this is where two of them match, David being the orange, and his sister Imogene being um, the other, the yellow right there. And then again, you see these are other people, Koi, and down here we have two others. This is Lonan and Celeste thing that they match. They're not huge segments either. And of course, David and his um, sister match other places. But this on the matrix, the family tree DNA matrix, will help show it better, although I'm sure it's not in focus since it's a screenshot. They don't come out very well sometimes. But all of these people match each other, except this. Uh, Nancy, the descendant of that Mary Lenore Pitts, does not match Thelmer, and um, Nancy does not match Tom Thomas, the two the cousins that don't match. Okay? That's not bad. Five out of seven 
So they're pretty confident. And this is what the genealogy uh, descendant chart looks like for David. Oops. For David and for Nancy and their fourth cousins. Okay, testing tips. Very important. Attend lectures. You need to, but that, that way you can get your questions out. That way you hear it from different people. You hear the same thing from different people. It's going to um, tune in to you. Are you going to be able to understand? I may not be the person that will help you the most. It may be some other person talking about autosomal. So ten, attend all you can. Read books, webinars. Family Tree DNA gives free webinars monthly. I'm going to give you this clue. Sign up for them, even if you cannot make the date. I can't most of the time, but what happens is you get a link, and then you go see it whenever you wish. So sign up for them. And if you scroll down at the bottom of the home page, you'll find it. You need to um, read books. I have one in the back if you're interested. But increase your knowledge of ge genetic genealogy and genealogy and do all of that uh, uh, testing or collection of your genealogy families. Understand each type of DNA test. That's very important because you want to pick the one that works for you. And they each test differently. Um, formulate your goals before you test so you're not disappointed. We don't want disappointed people. We want people that understand this and can use it and are happy with it. Determine which best suits your needs, which test best suits. And I leave you with one of my favorite ones. Can you read it in the back? It says, so that would make a second cousin once removed, the great aunt of my first cousin twice removed. No, wait, no, wait. That can't be right. And this is why Einstein quickly moved on to general relativity. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we've time for a few questions. So, um, who'd like to ask a question? We have a question down here. Um, when you spoke about identifying the half identical regions, you compared Gerald, I think, with Daniel. I'm just wondering how you did that. On the chromosome browser, um, I could see that the two matched each other in chromosome 9. And then um, I can go back in through Family Tree DNA and look at Gerald's and see if Dan comes up on his match list. Part of the easy problem is the fact that I, I manage both of their accounts. However, let's say you don't and you can't figure out how to do it with Family Tree DNA that they're just recently uh, started allowing us to do this. Email them. You get the email. You just email them and say, hey, do you match whoever the other one is? And tell me where you match them. Do you match them from this chromosome, this point to that point? That's all you have to do. A question here? No, you can do that on Family Tree DNA directly, though, now, can you? Yes, yeah. now you can. But it may be kind of difficult for some newbies to find out. You just email them. First of all, you want to be able to talk to them anyway, right? You want to encourage a conversation between the two of you because you want to share pedigrees. So I often just email them. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one here. I was thinking of uh, doing a, investigating a possible link to somebody who would be a fourth cousin. Um, did I understand you to say that as a preliminary, you should carry out a test with a nearer cousin, and would that be on the same side of the family or on the opposite side of the family? Well, it's best if you can test as many second and third cousins as you can. If you're concerned about a fourth cousin, I don't know what level, I mean, do you have a clue where they are related to you or not? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a question of whether, the, sorry, it's a question of whether the person with, the, whether our ancestor who has the same name is the same person or a completely different person. Okay. Um, is it an all Y line or is it go back and forth to mom and dad's? Um, no, it, 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 my line would be all male, but uh, her line would be uh, her. a bit okay. of... Bit of Okay, and what, you need the whole picture to make a good answer, right? So both of you would be able to test the family finder test. You have a 50-50 chance of matching. Let's say you don't. It doesn't mean you're not fourth cousins. You need to investigate further. So try to test more fourth cousins, others that you know, others that she knows. And if they match, then you're home. Any other questions? 
Okay. Well, um, I do believe that there is going to be a raffle now. Oh, for oh now. yes. <laughs> Why do you think everybody's waiting? <laughs> oh, so, you had to run away. Good. Okay, time to wake up. So, um, Emily, Emily has written the most recent book on genetic genealogy. And, this um, is... and you'll see examples of it down there at the back of the room. So if you're not lucky enough to actually win one of these raffles uh, today, then you can always purchase the book. Do you want me to pick them? Uh, it's not going to be on my head. <laughs> right. The ticket is? Last three numbers of one. Oh, well, you read it. Uh, 172. Anybody in the room with 172? Who's got 172? 172? You do? No, it's probably right in here. So <laughs> 172. No, 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 dear. It's not the book. You don't give them the book. <laughs> You're 172? Oh, James, well done. Okay. Okay, we got our first winner. I so you out... use this, and if it doesn't work with an iPhone or something, there is a, a, a way of getting into it. Thank you. Oh, pick, thank you. We pick three out, don't we? Three. Okay, two more. Well, the second one is 182, so it's um, 10 more. 182. I'll pick out the He's stuck on two. Is anybody with 182 out there? 182. You have to be present to win. And <laughs> the third one is 177. 177. 177. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. And 182? 182, 182 is not here. Last call for 182. 182. All right. No. Grab another one. Shall we do another one? Yes. Okay, one last. Uh, and this one is going to be... Let me see. With my glasses. Oh, it is 169. 169 out 169? there? 169? Do we have a 169? You do, all right. Oh, we have a 169. Oh, Excellent. Good, okay. thank you. And great. you know, the great thing about having... Thank you. The great thing about having an e-book is that all the links in the book are hot. So it's going to be quick and easy. I've had people that will buy the book and the e-book just for that reason. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Emily Olasino. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. Oh, take me off. Don't you want this?